Live from Case at 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Good morning. It's Thursday, January 9th. You are this close to Friday. A lot of you out there may be doing what's called dry January, right? That's a, become a very popular thing. And now a new article has shed light on the fact that it may be more beneficial. It, it could be beneficial to more than just your liver. Many Americans would benefit financially from a dry January, according to a survey conducted by the Harris Poll for TD Ameritrade and provided exclusively to USA Today. All right, so it included 1,011 adults, 23 and up, and found that millennials spend about $300 a month on alcohol and $56 per outing. Gen Xers and Boomers spend about 151 and 97 respectively on booze each month. Dining out plays a big role in these costs as 58% of millennials surveyed order alcohol or an alcoholic beverage when they eat out. So with food comes alcohol, said Lauren Shaw, age 25, in this article. So she committed to her first dry January in 2016 and then she turned 20 after she turned 21 and it was mostly to detox from the holiday diet and then she found out she was saving a lot of money. For Shaw, a weekend of drinking could cost anywhere from 300 to 500 on the high end, 50 to 60 dollars on the low end. And she also said, when you're not drinking, you're not going out as much. You're not. You are less likely to eat garbage and go to bed so late. So there are health benefits other than the liver. Brings about a host of smarter decisions. It sure does. A couple of different people had talked about it and said, you know what? It's true. I saved a lot of money. One guy said he saved like what six, seven hundred dollars a month, um, stopping that. But 81 percent of millennials said cutting back on alcohol made them realize how much they were spending on it. Well, it takes that original argument that you'll save a ton if you, if you make your own coffee versus going to a coffee shop. This just takes it a step further because alcohol is so much more expensive. And especially when you're eating out and drinking out. Mm -hmm. All right. So keep that in mind. If you're doing a dry January, you may save some money. Good luck. Let's take a look at your rundown. We have sent a powerful message to terrorists. If you value your own life, you will not threaten the lives of our people. Although some support the president's decision. No more war. We want peace in the Middle East. Others disagree. The U.S. military says many people have received fraudulent text messages saying they've been selected for the draft. The military saying these text messages are fake. The U.S. State Department has issued a new travel warning. It's calling this year's fire season one of the worst in Australia's history. Conditions are expected to get worse tomorrow. Officials now say the fires could burn until April. Senator Lindsey Graham says the Senate trial will begin next week, even though House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has not turned over the articles of impeachment yet. A federal judge in South Texas could decide today whether to lift a temporary restraining order against a project trying to build a privately funded border wall next to the Rio Grande River. A terrifying video of a child walking on a ledge outside this building in the Canary Islands, four stories up. Reports say her mother was in the shower when she got outside. Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, announced Wednesday that they would be stepping back as senior members of the British royal family. The couple made their announcement via their Instagram account. Supermarket Sweep is coming back to ABC. This time, former SNL star Leslie Jones will host taping begins this spring. Organizations and businesses beginning to promote their Fiesta 2020 medals, all with their own quirky designs and unique twists. Here are a look at a few of them. A marketing firm is pushing a plan to add more commercials before the movie starts. These ads would run closer to the movie's start time. I need all that preview time because I'm late. I got to get with the snacks. Always late. And my snacks are always in my purse. <laughs> now, I don't know if she should have said that on television because next time she goes to the movie theater, they're going to check her purse. It's very possible. Yeah, it's very possible. Plus, so now you can build in 10 to 20 minutes before your movie, right? Yeah, then you know it. Yeah, hey, going back to that little toddler girl that was running, which is she was like running on the ledge of, of that big building. So scary. Her mom said she was taking a shower and had no idea that her daughter had climbed out of the window. I hadn't seen it yet. How frightening would that be? And then to have someone get video of it. Thank mm -hmm. goodness she's OK. That's the main thing, right? Lock the windows before she did. they're very handy at that stuff. Let's go outside with live cam right now. Um, I know we're in winter right now, Justin, but it uh, looks like we're setting up for more spring-like weather pattern around town. You're right. We may actually see some thunderstorms tomorrow. You look at that picture, you would think it would be cold outside, but it is not. Temperatures in the upper 60s. It's very humid. 
and it's going to stay that way all day long. It'll, it'll be sort of sticky and we'll see uh, cloud cover too. 67 degrees right now at the airport, 66 Gonzales, 70 down there in Victoria. So no cool air on that map. Dew point is at 60. That shows you the dew point and the moisture has increased significantly from where we were yesterday. Southerly winds at about 17 miles per hour. Let's look at the radar. And you'll see that there's not a lot to see here. We've got a, a few light showers working out to the north, uh, mainly east of San Antonio. A few light returns off to the west. too. We could see a few sprinkles today, but it's not going to be significant rainfall. That's going to hold off until Friday. But a lot of cloud cover. Uh, we're going to see cloudy skies basically all day long. Pollen count is in. Mountain cedar, for whatever reason, jumped up into the very high category. That's just wrong. Uh, mold is moderate. Hopefully mountain cedar comes back down tomorrow, and hopefully some of this rain will help to wash it out a little bit. 75 degrees for high temperature today. Again, cloudy to mostly cloudy. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. We're going to time out some of those thunderstorms when we think they'll arrive. That's coming up in just a couple minutes. Guys. Thanks, Justin. There's 90 Azar Zamora, and we've had an incident out there for about two hours now. We had major delays due to a vehicle rollover accident. Looks like that ramp is still shut down in that area. Folks are having to take a uh, Turn on the left turn signal and then we've got an ambulance out there with one vehicle at 410 and Starcrest. Don't have a direction. Top stories that we're following for you today. The Riverwalk expected to be back to normal this morning. That's right. Crews drain the river from Josephine to Nueva Streets Monday to make some repairs. Biologists with the River Authority also got involved by removing an invasive species called the apple snail. The snails were discovered in October and several pink egg sacs were collected then. Water levels should be back to normal later on today. Innovation and education. The University of Texas at San Antonio ties both of those topics together. As part of our new series leading essay, Max Massey sat down with Mayor Ron Nirenberg to discuss some big topics like the expansion of UTSA. The mayor says the university is on the rise and can be instrumental in our city's future. Mayor Nirenberg says he thinks UTSA is going to ultimately become a tier one research institution. He says he's also looking forward to the School of Data Science and the National Security Collaboration Center both being developed downtown by UTSA. But ultimately, it means that we also have to create opportunities here. Uh, young people will, will go where they want to live and also where they can get a job that they have trained in or been educated in. UTSA is just one of the many topics discussed in this week's leading essay. Sunday morning at 8, we're going to discuss the mayor's visions for the future of the Alamo City, crime rates, homelessness, and what's next in innovative forms of transportation. After that, you will be able to watch the entire interview on KSAT.com and on our KSAT streaming app. Tensions with Iran have the U.S. House of Representatives set to take up a vote this morning. If passed, the proposal will limit the president's ability to take military action against Iran. The president has pushed for economic sanctions and suggested what he really wants is negotiations with Iran's leaders. Fede Huerta spoke with a local political science professor to get a better understanding of the relationship between the United States and Iran. <laughs> This is not World War III. Um, it's not happening. John Taylor teaches foreign policy analysis at UTSA and has been keeping a close eye on the U.S. and Iran situation. He says tensions have been building for years. The 1979 uh, Iranian Islamic Re Revolution and the overthrow of the Shah. Um, 1979 as well, the hostage situation, which lasted 444 days. Uh, tensions in the Gulf and in, in, in the Middle East from the 1970s and 80s until the present. Um, Basically, we fought what you might call a, a 40 year plus low level, low intensity war. In May 2018, President Donald Trump withdrew the U.S. from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. The agreement offered Iran sanctioned relief in exchange for limits to its nuclear program. President Trump called it a one sided transaction that wasn't working for the U.S. and imposed sanctions on Iran, crippling its economy. I get what Trump was doing. However, if you're going to try to prevent Iran from getting the bomb, you might want to actually stay on the Stay in, stay in the negotiating room and stay at the table. We didn't do that. Since those sanctions, Iran has been, as some would call it, acting out, increasing its attacks. Just last month, there were Iranian-backed terrorist attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. On Thursday, President Donald Trump ordered a drone strike that killed a top Iranian general and other officials. The Trump administration said it killed General Qasem Soleimani because he was planning new attacks against the U.S. As the head of the Quds Force, 
Soleimani was personally responsible for some of the absolutely worst atrocities. He viciously wounded and murdered thousands of U.S. troops, including the planting of roadside bombs that maim and dismember their victims. Thousands of people filled the streets in Iran for Soleimani's funeral procession. Taylor says while some idolize Soleimani because of his success expanding upon Iran's regional goals. Some of fact have suggested that it was possibly his own people who might have tipped off the Americans and the Iraqis about what were uh, the, the movements of, of the general um, and that this actually was not just related to international politics, but to Iranian domestic politics. Iran retaliated with missile attacks on two American military sites in Iraq. If you listen to the Iranian foreign minister, um, he talks about he's following under the UN charter regarding use of force. Um, it was, it, you might call it a tit for tat, for want of a better term. Um, and it's fascinating because it was not designed to do major damage. Taylor says this doesn't mean fight between Iran and the U.S. is over. I would not be surprised to see some sort of, of retaliatory action against a high-ranking American asset at some point in the future at, at the Iranians choosing. While President Trump said he will be imposing new sanctions on Iran, he also offered an olive branch. The United States is ready to embrace peace with all who seek it. I'm Tiffany Huertas. To see more stories like this, check out KSAT News at 9, Monday through Friday. A good big picture explainer yeah, of the situation. Very 909, 67 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at 9. So many children in the foster care system, there's always a need for more foster parents. Our very own Erica Hernandez and her husband decided to embark on that fostering journey last month. Erica is here to tell us how it's all going. That's how you get it done. Spurs getting some momentum with another win last night, this time against the Celtics. RJ Marquez here with a little bit uh, later on with some highlights. And sometimes the news can get a little interesting. After the break, we're going to tell you about the search for a Georgia man accused of breaking into a Taco Bell, making himself some food, and then taking a nap. Right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 120 points at 28,864. Welcome back at 9:13. Taking a look at some of your other morning headlines, new clues this morning about what happened to that Boeing 737 that went down in Iran, killing everyone on board. Iran has disputed claims that the plane was shot down and now says the crew was trying to turn back to the airport when the plane actually crashed. The Ukrainian passenger jet carrying 176 people disappeared from radar just minutes after taking off from Tehran. Experts say only three things could cause such a crash mechanical failure, a bomb, or a shoot down. Iranians deny shooting down the jet liner and say they've recovered the black boxes, but will not provide those boxes to U.S. authorities or even to Boeing. Jesse Smollett making headlines again this morning. A judge has ordered Google to turn over a year's worth of the actor's emails, private messages, photographs, and location data to a special prosecutor. It's part of an investigation into why prosecutors uh, abruptly dismissed charges against Smollett. Chicago police claim he was hoping to promote his career by paying two brothers to stage an attack against him. Cook County State's Attorney's Office later dropped all 16 charges against him. In the new warrant, the special prosecutor is seeking information from the Google accounts of Smollett and his manager, including files from their Google Drives, Google Voice texts, and a web browsing history. Well, here's a story you don't hear every day. Police in Georgia looking for a man accused of breaking into a fast food restaurant, preparing food, and then deciding to take a little nap. Mm -hmm. And it happened at an Atlanta area Taco Bell on Christmas morning. And there's video of it. It shows the man climbing through the drive through window. He turns on the fryer. He whips himself up a meal and then takes a nap on the floor. They say about three hours later, the man woke up and left the store. He got away with a laptop and a tablet from the restaurant. And he was fully rested with a full belly. That's impressive. Mm. I wouldn't know how to use one of those fryers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't either. He could have burnt the whole place down, couldn't he have? Could have. But there was yeah. really great shots of his face, too. So he wasn't really, I don't think, thinking very clearly. Mm -hmm. I don't think so either. Mm. Mm. Interesting run for the border. <laughs> That's hilarious, Mark. Nicely played. All right, so tomorrow's a good movie day. Tomorrow, well, at least tomorrow evening, I think we're going to get some thunderstorms around here. It's not going to last very long, though, mm -hmm. so if you do have evening plans, maybe we'll get these thunderstorms out of here, but you can uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, let's first start with the drop monitor, and it's 
still not a great situation. I mean, this hasn't changed much the last couple of weeks, but we are still very much in drought here around South Texas, especially as you get out towards Uvalde and Del Rio. That's where we're in extreme drought here in San Antonio, more of a moderate drought, but we still need rainfall nonetheless. And really, it is right here in our area where the drought is at its worst here in Texas. 38% of the state is in drought, 36% a week ago. So again, we're pretty much status quo there. Doppler radar shows that we do have a few very, very light showers. This is nothing more than a couple of sprinkles. And we'll see a few of these through the day, uh, especially as you get east of San Antonio. That's where we could see some of these very, very light showers. We're seeing that around Gonzales this morning. Nothing here in San Antonio at the moment, but a lot of cloud cover. And as we zoom out here, uh, you can see that uh, we've got quite a bit of clouds uh, stretching from West Texas all the way down to San Antonio, Houston, and cloud cover is, is not going to dissipate much today. There is the front, and it will be making some headway tomorrow, and it should push in, I'd say, around dinner time tomorrow, and that's when we'll have our chance for thunderstorms. Here's a time lapse. A lot of clouds, but uh, not a bad morning. 67. Looks like it would be cold out there, but it is not. Dew point is at 60. Southerly winds at about 17 miles per hour, and winds have been fairly breezy. And looking at the uh, satellite picture, you see all the clouds that are in place right now. Temperatures in the 60s, 63 Eagle Pass, 63 Carrizo Springs here around San Antonio, 67 in Randolph, 67 in Castroville, and 66 down there in Pleasanton. Uh, dew points are very high. It is very sticky. Uh, we may even see dew points go a little bit higher than this this afternoon, which is fairly impressive. So that is setting the stage for that potential for rain. Let's walk you through the forecast here. By 6 o'clock today, we've got mostly cloudy skies. We could see some sun out to the west. That's possible. And then a couple of those light showers, as we mentioned, off to the east. By tomorrow morning, still very cloudy. We've got some drizzle uh, around. And then by, say, 5 o'clock, we start to see some of those thunderstorms developing right along that cold front. If you're out west, I don't think you're going to get much rain at least initially, but this line will build a little bit and by 8 o'clock it's moving towards San Antonio and then by 10 o'clock it's moving towards our eastern counties and then it's out of here and so by midnight we're clearing out and we'll get some uh, clearing skies on Saturday. It'll be just a little bit cooler and breezy. Uh, when we're talking about severe weather, there is a marginal risk for that more of a slight risk across our far eastern counties and then as you get up into northeast Texas, that's when we're talking an enhanced risk with uh, some Pretty decent shot at uh, some thunderstorms there. Uh, maximum rainfall potential here around San Antonio, probably about a half an inch if we're lucky. That's going to be at the high end, lesser amounts out west, and then up to three quarters of an inch for those north and east of us. So the forecast for today, cloudy for the most part, 75 degrees, southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour, and then tomorrow 78, 40% chance of storms late, and then 63 and breezy on Saturday, 64 Sunday. More cloud cover next week, but it stays warm. We're still talking 70s here, so it's been sort of spring-like, and that doesn't change much. Yeah, but the weekend looks fantabulous. The weekend looks good. Thanks. Yeah. Announced 918, 67 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at night after struggling with fertility, our Erica Hernandez and her husband decided to become foster parents. Erica joins us in the studio after the break to tell us about the fostering process and how it's all going so far. Welcome back, everybody. It's now 922. Current stats in Texas show there are just under 30,000 children in foster care, so there's always a need for more people to help out and become foster parents. Digital journalist Erica Hernandez and her husband became first-time parents to a foster child about a month ago. Erica is joining us now to talk more about how it's been going. Good morning, Erica. Good morning. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your experience. Of course. I know it's going to help a lot of people. I hope there. so. It's not easy to talk about. Oh, no. <laughs> so let's start with how's parent life? It's a lot harder than I expected. It's hard work. It is hard work, and you never think about it. You think of all like the good times and the things you're planning and taking them places, but you don't think about those times that are a struggle and that are harder than you expect. And a child that has traumatic or neglectful experiences, just, you just it just brings another level. How uh, old is she? This isn't a baby. A no, she's foster. she's a toddler. She's three, and uh, we can't reveal her identity because of uh, of. of you know the whole this you know she's still a foster kid um but she is amazing i mean she has had a rough life but she is very smart she is hilarious and a joy to be around but she does have her moments where it's it gets really hard and they call the first couple days or whatever the honeymoon phase mm -hmm. um but honeymoon's over it, was, it wasn't even 24 hours before it was over and the first tantrum was thrown. And I, I get it, toddlers throw tantrums, but these are at a whole other level. You know, they'll last sometimes hours. 
and you just have to just sit there and be patient and it's very frustrating. Let's talk about the length of the process to become licensed to become a foster parent. Yeah, okay. so it, it kind of depends on your, your own time. Um, we started it actually last January, but then we had a few setbacks when my husband had a, a surgery in, in May, so we kind of stopped with the classes and then resumed them back in July. And we were officially licensed by October. Um, there's a lot of classes, there's a lot of inspections that you're not told about at first, like fire inspection, you have at-home visits. It's, it's a very- a lot of them are unannounced, right? Yeah, a lot of them are unannounced, but that's once you get a child. Um, those are the unannounced visits with CPS and of course with your agency. Um, and finding an agency, there's so many agencies, so you gotta find one that works best with you. And we have a, a great group of ladies who help us from the San Antonio Foster and Adoption Services Agency, and they're amazing and always on call. So if I need something at three o'clock in the morning, I can mm. call and they will pick up and help. All right, how long was the process? You said it was almost a year for you, but you yeah, had a couple you, of setbacks. So what's like the normal time frame? It could be three to six months. Oh, okay. It so works on your long. schedule. Okay. It's not that long. And you know, they really want people to do this and step up and, you know, so they're trying to do it as fast, but also teach you everything you need to know um, with the process. So we were licensed by October and um, by December we got our call. We'll talk about some of the struggles you had to deal with in this, in this time frame now. There's so many things. So the, the day she was, she was initially dropped off, we didn't know too much about her backstory. We were just getting in little pieces of it. And with a child that's had you know, so much trauma, you want to know their backstory so you can better understand what they're dealing with and can approach it the way it needs to be approached. But you start just getting little pieces of it from different parts of you know, the and system. And your yeah. experience is when you really find out. Yeah, that. exactly. So after the first day when she had her real first huge blowout and then it was like daily, nonstop, it was really like, oh my gosh, I would just sit there crying and trying to figure out what are we doing wrong? Like what are, how do I help her? How do I help her? You know, I just want her to be happy and like we're giving her a loving home. She's the only child here. She has everything she needs. But the tantrums would get so you know, so bad and we just kinda were like so after that first week we kinda got more of her story and really sat back and kinda reevaluated ourselves as well and how we were approaching it, how we were talking. We realized options work best for her, we'll give her options to so she can decide what she wants to do. So if there are people out there who are considering well, you are encouraging people. You oh, yeah. No, I don't want <laughs> But it, it, it's hard. It's you not easy. Go into it with your eyes open. What tips do you have for them? So I, have, I actually have, I put five tips in the article. The first one is be prepared because there are so many appointments, visits, random phone calls. Luckily here at KSET, they've been really amazing and, and, and flexible, allowing me to, you know, leave for an appointment or come back and change my schedule up a little bit. Um, reach out to other foster parents. I found the best advice was just, uh, joining some foster uh, parent groups from Bear County Sarah, on Facebook and I would just ask a question and immediately would get answers from other foster parents. And nobody knows better than those who've experienced the same thing that you have. Um, staying organized, there's so much paperwork that has to be done, not only just weekly but monthly and you have to keep track of it all. A good relationship with your spouse is so important. You have to be a great team and your relationship is so important. And if it's not working there, it's not gonna translate sure. with the child. Um, and then just enjoy the ride. I mean, it slapped me in the face the first week as far as like the reality is of it all and it's not as easy. The as lack of sleep. Exactly, because oh, she has okay. extreme sleep anxiety as well, so we're not sleeping at all. Um, so, but it's so worth it when you see her smile or the first time she goes up to hug us. Like it was like, oh my God, she's coming Those along. Yeah, it, it's hard, but you, you see the reality that she is finally where she needs to be. All right. Thanks for sharing your very personal story, Erica. I love we wish you guys the best. Thank you. Good luck. Absolutely. More head on GMSA at nine. The consumer electronics show is going strong in Las Vegas. There are plenty of new gadgets being introduced, from a smart trash can to a smart toilet. We have details on some of the most interesting ones. Way to go, Spurs! Silver and Black got their second straight win last night. RJ joins us after the break to tell us about some of the best moments. Welcome back. Spurs get a fantastic win in Beantown to start mm -hmm. their four-game road trip. We just had a whole conversation about how Boston <laughs> got the name. Beantown, Beantown. Which you can now tell them because you looked it up. RJ is here to recap the Spurs Celtics game and tell us about the controversy with a fan during that game. Yeah, All right, yeah. so this is twice in a row. Two great teams. We're talking about a win. Yeah, two great teams. Uh, two big wins over Eastern Conference opponents. Of course, the Spurs took care of business against Milwaukee the other day here at home. And then they traveled to Boston against, again, one of the better teams in general in the league. 
And Boston had everyone playing. Kemba Walker, their all-star guard, everyone was good to go. Uh, Spurs came out in a big way. Started off with a big lead here and did not really relent throughout the whole game. They were jumped out to a 14-3 lead. And uh, you could see this guy right here, Lonnie Walker, flying up and down the court. So it was just a lot of fun to watch uh, these guys get into uh, their game and get into the groove a little bit. Again, shooting a lot more three-pointers. And DeMar DeRozan, I want to take a second here to talk about DeMar DeRozan. He is playing great. Getting no all-star love, no all-star attention Look for at DeMar. That. Yes, that's a shame. Uh, people need to go vote for DeMar DeRozan for the all-star game because the, the Spurs don't want to lose that streak of like 20 straight years with an all-star player. And then uh, Lonnie Walker there closing out the game, scored 19 points in 19 minutes. And Lonnie is just a uh, Lonnie is just an exciting guy to watch. For anyone that's gone to the games this year, anytime he's about to check in, you could tell there's just a buzz about him coming in because I, look, I don't want to get too far out on the ledge with Lonnie, but he's very reminiscent of kind of what Manu brought to the game. Oh, wow, that's um, In the, a sense of excitement when he comes in, a sense of you just don't know what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and I think that uh, Lonnie's definitely going to give Pop a lot more gray hairs. Uh, Pop already has gray I was hairs. That, say, does he have any more? Oh, yes. Yeah, that, that Manu <laughs> gave Pop uh, when Manu was young, but kind of in that same mold. And again, no fear. That's the way sort of Lonnie right, Walker you plays. you have some sound bites, or do you want to talk more about some of the key moments uh, that are making the highlight reels No, this uh, so, okay, so no sound, but we did want to talk a little bit Bit about this interesting moment in the third quarter. So here's we this go. big fan controversy here. Uh, no call there against LaMarcus Aldridge. Uh, Kemba Walker kind of loses his mind a little bit, starts yelling some profanities at the refs. Seat up. There's and... a lot of chaos going on here. But in the midst wow. of all this, you could see from the stands a full can uh -oh. of beer flies over the Spurs players' heads. Okay, that's not so okay. this literally landed maybe like right at their feet. I mean, right over their heads, it was a full can of beer that was launched from a Celtics fan onto the floor uh, after the game. Of course, well, this Celtics fan was ejected. Well, there's and so many things that could have happened there. It could have slipped and hurt players. Somebody could have gotten hit in the head. That is just I think, not smart. Yeah, mostly I think just someone possibly getting hit in the head or maybe in the back. I mean, it was literally like right over the heads of a few Spurs players right there. And Kimball wasn't the only one to get teed up last night. So did the Celtics coach, right? Yeah, Brad Stevens got a technical too. So there was a lot going on during that moment there. Uh, Brad Stevens did say after the game he apologized to Pop and he apologized to the Spurs for that fan doing that and that he said he hopes that that fan is banned from it's not uh, their attending fault. Yeah, games. Yeah, that was yeah. classy. So, um, so yeah, some, a classy move there, but at the same time, just uh, just dumb and dangerous Did by I the fans. Did I see that this was Kimba Walker's first ever ejection? It was his first ever ejection, <laughs> and the ref said after the game, apparently he said some pretty profane things to ah, him. Ah, So, okay, yeah, you cannot, uh, don't mm -hmm. curse at the refs. That's going to be the easiest way to mm -hmm. get a, a couple of technicals. What's next for our guys? So we get Memphis next mm -hmm. uh, at Memphis. As Memphis. David Sears likes to say, yeah, uh, that game is tomorrow at 7 p.m. It is the second game of a four-game road trip. And, again, the Spurs playing some of the best basketball of the season, and uh, it's taking it a little up. bit of time. Yeah, Keep Pop has kind of been tinkering with this lineup a little bit. And Lonnie Walker, again, just a fun guy to, to watch. Oh, it's great. I hope yeah. he, he continues to be in the starting yeah. lineup and play an awesome yeah. role on the bench, too. Definitely, definitely. Um, again, Bean Town. It bean has town. to do with Let's Boston <laughs> baked beans, the style of beans. That's how I got the Coffee name. beans. But not for Bostonians. Everybody else yeah. around the world calls it Bean Town, but people in Boston, they don't call they it don't, that. They yeah. don't do that. That's some good stuff. RJ, there. thank yeah. you yeah. very Thanks, much. Guys. Good to hear from our team uh, doing very well right now. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Bring Justin Horn into this conversation. Hey, Justin. Hey there. I'm excited to see the Spurs winning a couple games here. We're on a roll. We're going to do this. And the weather's on a roll, too. We're going to get some rain chances coming in here tomorrow. Some decent chances, I think, tomorrow evening. Maybe some thunderstorms. Maybe a couple strong storms. And that really is the big story next couple days. Temperature-wise, right now, we're in the 60s. It's fairly warm for this time of year. A lot of places sitting in the 60s. A few 50s as you get up into the hill country. But 67 Pleasanton, 63 Carrizo Springs, 63 in Eagle Pass. Let's zoom out a bit and take a look at the state. You'll notice there's some cooler temperatures up in the Panhandle. 51 in Amarillo, 43 right now in Lubbock. There's a frontal battery up there. This is the front that's going to be moving through tomorrow night and kicking up some of those showers and storms. Doppler radar shows we've got some light activity out there. Nothing that's heavy at all. And uh, we probably won't see much in the way of rain today. 75 degrees for high temperature. Mostly cloudy. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. But again, those rain chances kick in tomorrow. And in the wake of those storms, some great weather over the weekend. We're going to take another look at that seven day forecast here in just a couple minutes. Guys, see what happened on the roads real quick. It looks like that ramp finally back at open there at Zarzamora. We had a major tra traffic incident that affected 
the entire morning commute. Imagine being a teenager and people are asking, what did you do when you were a teen? And you could say, I discovered a planet. I was an intern at NASA and I happened to discover, discover a, planet. a planet. Like on my third day in my internship. Yeah, at NASA, a planet NASA scientists and rocket scientists never seen before. That's so me. the kid's from, I think, from Scarsdale, New York. His mm -hmm. name is Wolf. How do you think you pronounce that last Kukier name? Kukier or Kukier. Kukier. All right, 17 year old from Scarsdale High doing a summer internship at Goddard Space Flight Center outside DC over the summer when he made the cosmic discovery. He said it took some time to actually verify that it was a bona fide planet and not the telescope shaking or something. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, you know, it's a little far away. He said, when I first found it, it was among a hundred other things I flagged to start. I do think I put like 10 asterisks next to it. I thought it looked pretty good compared to the rest of the things I saw. His find is Tess's first circumbinary, circumbinary, how do you say that? Circumbinary? Circumbinary, that's mm -hmm. it, planet, a celestial object that orbits two stars. He doesn't get to name it, though. No, no. Uh, by the way, you mentioned Tess. Tess is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. What it boils down to, this kid was given basically a bunch of da data, and they said, go through here and see if you see any unusual variations. And he said he did the math, and he realized that this was this a was new something. planet. Yeah. And they found, they verified it and they said it was. Mm -hmm. And you don't get to name those planets because they get a T01 number mm -hmm. if they're discovered instead of you. So anyway, yeah. what's so this, this one's name? So this is TOI 1338B. And it's the only known planet within that system. It is 6.9 times larger than our planet, but definitely not habitable because it orbits too close to the sun. And he said, the funny thing is, I didn't find anything else for the rest of my internship, Aww. even though I found one on like day three. Well, that's okay, you discovered a planet. And he said he's, his astronomical credentials have made him a hero with his family, but he said, the funny thing is, oh, you said I didn't find anything else. Oh, well, I think you should be pretty proud of that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. 938, 67 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. If there's one thing that the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas has shown us, technology really is taking over the world. After the break, Eric Hernandez is back with details on some of the most interesting and possibly controversial creations. Hello, everyone. This is your Daily Tech and Business Briefing from Cheddar. Sprint will be shutting down their prepaid brand, Virgin Mobile. Now, this announcement comes on the heels of the telecom giant's planned merger with T-Mobile. Now, all current Virgin Mobile customers will be transferred to Boost Mobile at no additional cost. Meanwhile, the FBI is asking Apple for data from the iPhone that belonged to the Saudi aviation student who fatally shot three U.S. sailors at a Florida naval base last month. Investigators have been trying to access his iPhone, but they're locked out due to passcodes and various encryptions. Apple says they've already provided investigators with all the data that they have. And commercial airlines are rerouting flights throughout the Middle East to avoid flying over potential danger zones, all amidst rising tensions between the U.S. and Iran. Now, according to analysts, the altered routes could affect as many as 15,000 passengers, and it could lengthen their flight times by an average of 30 to 90 minutes. And that's Chatter Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It's a new decade, which means new gadgets. So we've been talking about CES now for, it seems like, over a week. It sure does. Right now, the Consumer Electronics Show is going on in Vegas, and Erica Hernandez joins us to talk more about some of the new concepts that have been released. And we did see the robot that brings you toilet paper. <laughs> That's right. What? I didn't see that one yet. Yes. Well, yeah. I just wonder, like, some of these gadgets are really unique, and I'm like, do you really need some of these things? Mm, maybe. maybe but I, I just wanted to know who loads the <laughs> toilet paper on the robot. <laughs> Well, here's three new ones. Her okay. first one, a smart trash can. Now, this trash can can do more than just hold trash. The smart can has an overload of features that detects when it can't take out, take on any more trash. All you have to do is push a button. It will automatically seal the bag and open so you can remove it. And that's not all. Once the old bag is gone, the trash can puts a new one in in its place. That's where it earns the money. Yeah. <laughs> this costs nearly $100 and comes in two colors, white and teal. Okay, okay, that's awesomeness. See, I'm just like, really? Now that unfortunately removes... That wouldn't be good for the kitchen, especially if you have those drawer ones that are pull out, but... Right. You know, and apparently, it, I think it helps like uh, prevent it, like spills and like yeah, stuff but, to happen around it. But and here's the downside. It removes a possible household chore for your, for your kid. Yeah. Yeah. 
So. No, they still have to take the trash out. They just don't have to tie it. They just don't have to tie it. And replace the bag. I, I understand. But but they don't have to like, because usually it's like, hey, you did forget to put the bag back in. And they're like, oh, no, the robot did that. That's yeah. true. And, and Oriana, our producer, just said it actually would probably be really good for diapers. Because it just closes yeah. it. Yeah, but then that's what a diaper genie for is for? I don't know. Yeah, but the diaper genie is to... Okay, we... Well, uh, anyway. We... <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a consumer electronic show without a robot. Samson has introduced Bolly, a personal assistant that looks like a this tennis ball. Me out. I know, but also moves a lot like BB-8, the droid from Star Wars. Bolly can follow you around the house and anticipate your needs. Samson expects and it to... And record you. Probably. Samson expects it to resonate well with pet owners because the robot can keep an eye on animals who are home alone. No, it records you. Oh, yeah, it's got a camera. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't want something following me around. In my house, all that, mm. It's, it's a, always listening, like that person under your bed. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, I don't, that's, yeah, that's a pass for me. And as smart devices are taking over our homes, we can't skip the bathroom. The company Kohler sh showed off its Numi 2.0 intelligent toilet. You can sit down on a heated seat, get some personalized cleansing and drying, and even listen to your favorite music through its built-in speakers. If you like to just chill while answering the call of nature, the smart toilet also has ambient lighting. And don't forget your shopping list. Amazon Alexa is at your beck and call. All that in a toilet. Okay, those fancy toilets have been around for You want Alexa me. listening to... What's <laughs> happening in this world? I'm just so confused. Wow. I mean, I'm the only thing that I, like, you. appreciate on this is the heated seating, because, like, on a cold morning or whatever, but... I think you can buy but it, that it's, already. It's, that's yeah, just, that's been around for... Why do you need lights and built-in speakers? Are you talking to Alexa? <laughs> A lot of questions. I am, yeah. Yeah. We have actually extended coverage of the Consumer Electronics Show on KSET.com. What is it going to be like in 20 years, people? Have you seen some of the TVs that they've come out with? Yeah. Why not? There's like a whole wall. Yeah, it's bizarre. Thank you, Erica. Thanks, guys. Think, thank you. All right. I don't understand the little ball thing. <laughs> it's your companion and friend. It follows you around well, and it checks it? on you and makes sure that you're okay and makes little noises and snuggles up against it you. It rolls up to you and says, <laughs> hey, tell your toilet to reorder toilet paper. <laughs> No, it goes, call them toilet robot. <laughs> Paper robot. Wow. So okay. much is changing. Uh, let's the weather, is it changing? It is, actually, yes. Uh, good segue. Let's talk about the aquifer. Uh, it has uh, been pretty steady here since November, but we're down some. We're down about four feet. And I show you this just, uh, you know, we're in good shape here, but I show you this because we are on a steady trend downward. And it's not the season where we see the aquifer really drop off. But we need some rain, and uh, there is some in the forecast. I don't know that it'll be enough to really help us out drought-wise, but at least there is a little bit. And we see on Doppler radar right now, we've got just some basically light returns out there, nothing that jumps off the page here. This is all going to be nothing more than a few sprinkles, but we may see a few more of these showers throughout the day, especially if you're east of Seguin, next and down towards Cuero. That's where you could see some of this light activity. Let's zoom out and show you the big picture here. you got a lot of cloud cover coming across Texas. Our storm system now starting to move into West Texas, or at least the frontal boundary. This isn't a strong front, but it's enough to get these uh, showers and storms going once it makes it into the more humid air down here across South Texas. That's going to happen tomorrow. So today is just basically a cloudy day. 67 degrees at the airport. Dew point is at 60. That number's huge, but suddenly winds at about 17 miles per hour. And I say that because dew points were really low last couple days, so this is shot up big time. And you see all the cloud cover moving across. So we've got some low clouds. We've also got some high clouds out there. So that means cloudy to mostly cloudy skies today. Temperatures 64 in Uvalde, 63 in Carrizo Springs, 67 in Gonzales, 71 right now in Kennedy, warmer there. Mostly mid 60s here around Bear County and San Antonio with cloudy skies. And uh, looking at the dew points, low 60s here in town. We're looking at upper 60s off to the east. This is spring like moisture that is moving in. And this is the 24 hour dew point change. The dew point has jumped up 28 degrees in the last 24 hours. So the moisture is just shoved in here and it's only going to go higher, I think, until we can get that front through here. So mostly cloudy today. This is around six o'clock, maybe some sun out west. Clouds build back in tomorrow morning and we'll get probably some drizzle, maybe a couple showers. And then at five o'clock, we start to see the potential for a few storms developing right along the front. By eight o'clock, I think it's moving towards San Antonio. So I'd say the time frame between 6, 9 o'clock here in town, that's when we can expect some of these showers and storms. A broken line, and then by 10 o'clock, it's moving into our eastern counties, probably building a little bit. And this is where we could see some of those perhaps stronger storms. By Saturday morning, 
all of this is clearing out. We're going to get a good weekend, just a little breezy on Saturday. Severe weather threat is there. There's a marginal risk here in San Antonio. Slight risk uh, as you get east on a scale of one to five. We're talking a two here and then three as you get up towards uh, northeast Texas and the Sale Grange College Station. That's where we can see some of those uh, perhaps stronger storms. The main threats with this is going to be uh, some hail and gusty winds. That's really it. Uh, I don't think uh, tornadoes are going to be on low end here, so that's not really a threat. But we'll keep an eye on it tomorrow. We'll keep an eye on the radar. 75 degrees today. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. And then 78 tomorrow, 40% chance of rain. 63 Saturday, breezy and cooler. We'll start off really chilly Sunday morning, but clouds build back in next week, and we're back to more of that spring-like pattern. Weekend again looks beautiful. It does. You got to walk it, watch around that camera. It's got a mean left hook. I'm telling you, man, every time. <laughs> and I forget that it, it's one of these days. Keeps us awake. 950, 67 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. We'll be right back. Good morning. Hey, guys. Coming up on live, Billy Porter will be here. <laughs> the best ever. Yep, you got to tell us about his new role in the movie Like a Boss. We'll see you in a little bit on live. Tomorrow on GMSA at 9, since 2010, two-thirds of fired San Antonio police officers won their job back through arbitration. Now, new case at Defenders Investigative Series is digging into misconduct and disciplinary procedures within SAPD. It's called Broken Blue. The one-hour investigative special will air this weekend right here on Case at 12. And tomorrow at 9, the Defenders, Dylan Collier and Tim Gerber will join us in studio for a debrief on what we can expect. If you are headed out the door in the next five minutes, here's what you can expect. 35 in Olympia Parkway, 35 upper and lower at Brooklyn, and we also have 35 at San Marcos. It's cloudy out there, but the, the roads are dry. We may see a stray shower today, but our better chance of rain arrives tomorrow evening. A chance of some thunderstorms, but it clears out for the weekend. Breezy on Saturday and cool. Justin, what are my two biggest fears? Let's see, sharks mm -hmm. and... Shellfish? Artificial intelligence taking oh, yes. over the earth Machines and the world. Over. Yes. Well, here we go again. Now they're going to decide what what's, what movie you're going to like and what star should star in it. I don't like this at all. Yeah, Warner Brothers has signed a deal for an AI-driven film management system. So what does that mean? Well, they're the latest studio to publicly embrace artificial intelligence. They, they will leverage a system from Synalytic. All right. It has comprehensive data and it has predictive analytics to guide decision making at the green light stage. So when they're just deciding if they're going to take on a project, first they're going to see what this AI has to say about it. The integrated online platform can assess the value of a star in any territory and how much a film is expected to make in theaters and on other what they call ancillary streams. So it'll decide who should star in it and whether or not it should even go. That's I don't know. Does. And they say it can calculate in seconds what used to take days to assess by humans when it comes to general film package evaluation of star's worth. What? I know. I didn't know that. Because it takes all this data of what it's done in the past, I guess. Now, of course, this industry in particular is worried about it because they're like, you know, they're going to take all of our jobs and they're scared it's going to take away jobs from all the humans, make humans obsolete. Yeah. Warner Brothers says, no, it's going to save us a lot of money. Like, yeah, they of need course. to save a lot of money. So they're going to use AI to bet on the next Joker versus a bomb like, say, what was it? The Kitchen, Shaft, or Godzilla, King of Monsters. Some I Warner Brothers flops. I prefer humans to bet on that. Thanks for being with us.